again, listen real hard to me. The exodus of my people from out of Egypt is going to be a joint operation. In other words, there are going to be the two of us involved in this mighty affair, comprising of about 600,000 adults and their little ones. Now again, listen hard to me. You're the one I have personally chosen to lead them out of captivity. You are to have an audience with Pharaoh and will relate to him my plan for the release of my people. So what do you say, Moses? But God, I can only tend my father-in-law's flocks these days. Besides, I'm wanted for murder in that land. And also the fact that I am now almost 80 years of age. Now look, Moses, I appreciate what you're saying, so here's a promise to get you started. First, I will be with you. Then one day when you have succeeded with my plan and extracted my people from out of Egypt, you will revisit this exact place, but in a different shepherd's role. And of all, all of Israel will serve me with love and honour upon this same mountain. But God, when I begin to share your plan with the people, who will I say has sent me? What name will I tell them? You will simply say, I am has sent me. Now here are a couple of miracles to increase your faith in me. That rod in your hand you used to protect the flock. Well, cast it onto the ground and see what happens. It's a serpent, isn't it? But don't be afraid. Pick it up by the tail. See? It's your rod again. This time put your hand inside your tunic and against your chest. <clears throat> now draw it out. It's leprous, isn't it? See how white it is. Put it back inside your tunic and bring it out again. It's back to normal, isn't it? These miracles will help to increase your faith and confidence in me and also my people as you begin to perform wonders in my name with this rod. But for the last time, Lord, I'm not eloquent in speech. My tongue gets all tied up a bit, which makes me awfully slow and nervous. Who made your mouth, ears and eyes? Didn't I? Anyway, here's your elder brother, Aaron, coming to see you. He's got a good flow of speech. He can be a spokesman for the both of us and to the people and Pharaoh. The next thing is to get your release from your father and Lord Jethro, who will oblige. Then you and Aaron can get organised with the elders of Israel. Negotiations were soon to begin between Moses and Pharaoh. Moses, now being close to 80 years of age, nevertheless willing for God to use him or expend him in the release and removal role of his people from bondage to a large and productive land flowing with milk and honey, as promised to the people's forebears many years prior. A gigantic undertaking, but Pharaoh was far from sympathetic to the idea, and God even saw fit to harden this displeasure of Pharaoh and make it seem an impossible task for Moses and Aaron. A variety of plagues will annoy, would annoy, annoy and irritate Pharaoh and his nation's people. Conversely, at the same time, be a mighty witness to God's untouched people. A harrowing time for Moses and his brother. Then to the midnight cry, when every Egyptian household experienced the death of a firstborn family member or servant, 
as well as firstborn of livestock. Pharaoh had finally had enough and orders were sent at night for the children of Israel to leave the land in haste. They had borrowed heavily from the Egyptians, gold and silver, jewellery. It would never be replaced. But it was just after midnight and very dark. How could it begin with such a mixed multitude of people and livestock, flocks, herds, and cattle? Answer? God would light up the sky with a pillar of fire and it would seem as if to be daylight and warm until the sun rose on the following morning. And so the stage is set. Operation Exodus is about to begin. An upheaval of such magnitude as never before recorded since time immemorial. Try to imagine the logistics, my friends. An entire nation uprooted and headed out at night into wilderness country, no man's land. Men, women and children, livestock and pets, food, clothing, water, etc., etc., etc. It would seem an impossibility, and it would have been, had the elders and leaders in each tribe not excelled in efficiency and leadership. But little did they know at the time it was going to be 40 long years of wanderings, pitching at one campsite to pitching at another, and add to this unforeseen disappointment brought on by themselves, no adult persons past the age of 20 years would ever set foot in the land that was promised. They would all over those years be buried beneath the wilderness sands and grit. But two faithful men, however, would merit the chance to carry on with added life in the new land. Returning to the assembly, though, their new living quarters from now on would be under the cover of tents, a far cry from the secured dwellings they had hurriedly, hurriedly left behind in Egypt after applying the blood to the lintel and side posts in order to escape the destroying angel's wrath. However, to their credit, they had initial faith and confidence in Moses and the 12 tribal leaders. For as promised, it was going to become ownership of new territory, new hope, new dwellings, food and water in abundance and no bondage. So a bit of inconvenience right now could be tolerated as long as it didn't carry on for too long. So they thought. Next, they were to discover that from that point on, their journeyings were to be governed by an ever-present cloud overhead. When it lifted and began to move, it was a sign to follow that tents and gear had to be dismantled, packed and carried until it again hovered stationary over the portable tabernacle at a new location. Then it was the same procedure all over again. The pillar of fire by night and the manna each morning would be guaranteed and continue as a boost to their confidence in their God and Moses. So the departure program was hurriedly set, although Moses had probably anticipated its arrival. The urgent message from Pharaoh at midnight was to be obeyed forthwith. Inconvenience to the departing Israelites was of no consequence to him. He had endured enough. Get out, he said. The great exodus was soon underway, and Moses was being guided by God as to what route to take, which led to the edge of the Red Sea. And following Pharaoh's change of mind, he was soon right behind with his elite fighting force, which included 600 chariots. <clears throat> God's cloud, though, was separating the two companies. 
whose cloud had moved from the front to the rear of the fleeing mass of people. Moses points his rod over the waters of the Red Sea and tells the people to stand still and witness the power of God over these waters. A powerful wind from the east prevails through the night, which is lit up by the pillar of fire as comfort and warmth to the people. And by the morning, a tract of dry land was showing through the seabed with a wall of water to each side of it. Moses encourages this great company of people and livestock to walk through. It's dry and rough, but they safely do so, gear and all, until the far side is reached. Meanwhile, Pharaoh and his pursuing army also begin to pass through this great divide. But when they, <coughs> but when they reach the deep mid-section, God sees through the cloud and pillar of fire and troubles the host of the Egyptian army, who then begin to drive their chariots to their limit, to no avail. Wheels separate from their chariots. Moses tells the people to once more observe the power of God. He stretches his hand and rod again towards this great trench. There is a mighty turbulence as the two walls of water crash into each other and swamp the entire Egyptian army. For that moment, at least, they had great fear of God and his servant Moses, the record states. The troubled waters in the meantime had begun to wash masses of dead bodies up on the shoreline and provided the warriors of Israel with loads of fighting equipment which were stripped from the drowned men. Moses and all the people break into triumphant song, safe on the other side. They had made a good start to their journey to the promised land, but after three more days in the wilderness of Shur, they had used up all their water, and when they did find it at Marah, it was bitter. Then began the start of the criticism of Moses, murmurings, etc., until he cast the branch into the waters which sweetened them. Their travels continue, and next up it's the wilderness of sin. More complaints and murmurings, etc. As they think back to the flesh pots and food previously enjoyed in Egypt, God introduces bread from heaven, manna, plus some quail in the meantime to satisfy them. Six days a week the manna would be present in the mornings. None would be provided by God on the Sabbath. Next, it's more travel. No water. Murmurings once more. Moses smites the rock at Horeb as instructed and water flows in abundance. A battle against Amalek is the next issue. Moses directs the battle from a hilltop with the outstretched rod of God with Israel prevailing while it is held aloft until his arms and hands had to be propped up due to fatigue. Now this went on until sundown. Jethro, his father-in-law, introduces the idea of assistance to a wearied Moses. The idea is accepted and put into practice. Sinai and another amazing experience. A spiritual one this time <clears throat> and God's promise once more of them being a special people to him. God begins his personal conversations with Moses. A cloud only between them both. There is thunder and lightning and fire upon the mountain and it is trembling and shaking. Moses is there in the midst of all this spectacular confusion and talking with God. The people, meantime, were forbidden to pass beyond the base of Sinai. Then there is a powerful voice that overrides all this confusion. It's the voice of God wanting to meet with the people. And while at the top of the smoking mount, with a trumpet sounding, 
God's finger writes the Ten Commandment law on two tables of stone. The people tremble when they witness God's glory as a devouring fire. Then God calls up Moses to the top of the smoking mount and remains in his presence for 40 days and 40 nights. He has given the two tables of commandments. Then Moses makes his way down from the mount. Then near the base he hears this great noise and din with people dancing around. He then sees a golden calf being worshipped. He is so downcast and angry he breaks the two tables of God's laws meant for the people. The children of the tribe of Levi were instructed to slay the worst offenders, about 3,000 men. But God wasn't finished with them. He plagues the people as a result of their sin and threatens to disinherit and discontinue leading them to the promised land. Moses is again called up to the mount by God and receives two new tables of commandments. When he returns with them this time, his face is glowing so bright the people could not look at him. By now, God presumes a stiff-necked people, but yet continuing with his promise to ultimately settle them in Canaan, it was still valid. Next, God wants the tribes numbered, excluding Levi, 603,550 men over the age of 20, able to wage war if necessary. They are again craving for flesh to eat, fish, cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions and garlic. They are sick of God's manna, so he gives them a quail for a whole month until they are violently ill, with many dying as a result. Twelve spies are sent forth for 40 days to check out the potential of the promised land. Ten report it is impossible to capture the land. It was very productive, they said, and had the evidence to back it up. But its menfolk were too powerfully built. Plus, these ten influenced the people to not respond. So from that point on, God said they would continue to wander in the wilderness for another 40 years until those over the age of 20 would perish because of their faithlessness. Their graves would be hitherto littered in the wilderness wastelands. More murmurings and God's threats and plagues. Moses' obedience is noted by God. Their next camp was pitched in the desert of Zin, no water. Moses is about to disobey his God. Instead of speaking to the rock as God had instructed, he strikes it and water flows. But it was a grievous mistake. Because of this disobedience, he was forbidden to lead the tribes over to the promised lands. Aaron dies. Camp movements now numbered 44. The borders of the promised lands are reached and the Amorites are driven out. Then one day soon after, Moses is impressed by God to climb to the top of Mount Pisgah in the land of Moab. He's still able to do so in spite of his increased age, which is now 120 years. God wants to show him something that will be of great interest to him and afterwards quietly put him to rest. Moses at this stage has more than an inkling about God's final plans for him. It's been a tough climb, but he eventually reaches the summit it's a perfectly clear day. And better still, 
his long-sighted vision is still unimpaired. God encourages Moses to view the immense landscape and vista in all directions which lie below the mount and tells him the 12 tribes of Israel would shortly possess all such territory and beyond. He also sees the tent city as a blur in the distance. Moses then takes his final breath. God conducts his funeral. There are no others present. He then places Moses' body in a secret hollow. This was a man who had often spoken face to face to God. They completely understood and loved each other. Joshua assumes Moses' leadership role and prepares to lead the people over to Jordan. God repeats his promise to Joshua. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you. Just as I had said to Moses. Then one night it seemed so different the people noted the usual pillar of fire was not lighting up the sky as it had previously done so for over 40 years. In the following day, the once ever present cloud above the camp was also not to be seen. And the manna was missing. After over 40 years, these supernatural elements or assurances and wonders from their God the borders of the promised lands were now at their feet. There was great excitement in the camp. All the land areas Moses had viewed or had been made known to the tribes were to become their property, God's gift to them. But they would have to fight for these lands. However, with God's blessings promised, it was always going to be a positive outcome from bondage and slavery to ownership, glorious ownership. The many sad failures that followed are another story which we won't bother to touch on today. We will instead check out our own situation, which is to do with our very own personal journeyings and wanderings through this life, culminating in the redemption of God's wondrous plans and promises to resettle us in lands that are much, much better than this present planet Earth, and to also reprogram, remake, and refashion our earthly bodies to be like unto his, Jesus' glorious body, the divine record states, able to live eternally. First up, it's a thousand year reign or heavenly experience with the Godhead and the angelic host. This will be a varied spiritual experience of worship, praise and love of the Godhead's three personalities, but especially so of Jesus Christ the Father's Son, who has made eternal life possible to us through his sacrificial gift to mankind. When he left this planet some 2,000 odd years ago, the promise was that he would return at the end of time to redeem those faithful to him over the ages of time. I'm sure we all want to dearly claim the reality of that promise because we too live in the same world, not just a land, but a world that has developed into a vast area of unspiritual wasteland. And yet, thankfully, God's beauty of our physical planet is still so abundantly evident, but sadly rife with every kind of sin and degradation abounding and continuing to abound therein. 
As for my personal thoughts, I truly believe we too have arrived at the borders of the heavenly kingdom, the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem. And we won't have to physically fight for the home as Jesus said he was going to prepare for us when he left this planet after securing our salvation at Calvary. But there's a very real and dangerous personality ever present whose business it is to counter God's love and plans for us and set up all kinds of obstacles and pitfalls to stop us, his people, from succeeding in our quest for eternal life. The children of Israel or Jacob had Moses to guide them to their promised lands and he carried out a most faithful role with only one recorded failure, but this single failure cost him the privilege of entering the lands of promise. He would only view such lands from the summit of Mount Pisgah, but would afterwards be taken to heaven as God's reward for his obedience and faithfulness. Whereas we have Jesus Christ, a type of Moses, to lead us to the eternal city of God. Then again, the children of Israel were sustained by the purity of God's water that gushed from the rock faces in the wilderness. Likewise, we too have to drink to spiritually survive of the purity of God's water from his wellspring of living water that never runs dry. Jesus offers and encourages us to drink often from this well that springs from his life of purity. I guess maybe you could liken prayer to drinking from God's wellspring of living water. In the physical sense, it's impossible to survive without water. It's a must. In the spiritual sense, it's impossible to survive without prayer. The lifeline or answer to a growing relationship experienced with Jesus Christ. The children of Israel were hemmed in, an army at their rear, a stretch of water directly in front of them. Moses stretched out the rod and God used a powerful wind to carve a trench through the Red Sea during the night. And in faith, the whole company of his people crossed through to the other side in safety. We too have trials and tribulations that threaten to block our way forward in our Christian experience. But there is worse to fear if we revert to our past ways of hopelessness. It's only bondage and slavery back there. What about the Sinai experience for the children of Israel when Moses remained on the mount top for 40 days and nights with his God? They having thought he had perished and quickly returned to their old sinful ways. How wrong they were. Another lesson for us as we wait patiently for our Lord's return, not from the top of a smoking, unfriendly mountain, but arriving from heaven in the clouds of radiant glory with myriads of angels accompanying him. The part text from Revelation 14 should challenge us today when it states, here is the patience of the saints, still remaining alive and faithful, it implies, through end-time tribulation, but with continuing trust in Jesus of his promised return and redemption. All I can say to this, friends, is hang in, especially those of you who still have the blessings of youth on your side because you are the ones who may not have to experience death in the wilderness of this planet 
as it develops into more the time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, as portrayed in Daniel's end time prophecy. Then too, repeating, there were the daily triple blessings which had begun even prior to the commencement of the 40-year wilderness sojourn, and carrying on right through to the end of that period, these being the ever-present cloud of God that hovered above the encampment of the people all through the daylight hours, after which a giant fireball or pillar of fire took over at dusk and continued through the nights to bring comfort and warmth to the resting people and children. And while under the warmth of this miracle fire during the nights, the people's daily bread grew and was ready to harvest each morning except on the Sabbath days when the manna did not appear. Love and consideration would have to sum up God's blessings of these supernatural daily happenings for over 40 years. Would you agree? Question. How does Israel's God, does Israel's God treat us any differently these days? His people of the 21st century? The answer is, of course, that he treats those today who love him and belong to him no differently in this 21st century showering down multiple and specific blessings upon us who are just as unworthy as were his people of old. Truly a God of love and consideration still, and promise to continue right through to the sealing time and Jesus reappearing in the clouds of glory. And to confirm this, the scriptures declare, I am God, and I change not. What supreme comfort for those who believe we live in the time of the end and his invitation is ever, try me out and see. So, dear friends, this concludes my brief summing up of the story of Moses and the children of Israel. And as well, a few associated lessons we today are blessed with and can benefit from as we compare our situation to theirs. When God sought out Moses at the back of Mount Horeb and canvassed him from the burning bush with the idea of accepting the responsibility of leading the children of Israel out of Egypt and out of bondage to the promised land, how would it actually turn out? Well, The answer we arrive at from God's word is that after over 40 years of wilderness wanderings, fraught with every kind of disappointment and failure of the people, it could be said of Moses that he had personally and faithfully responded magnificently to God's request of him. However, another personality performed his role even more magnificently. Jesus Christ was this more recent personality. He too, like Moses, was involved in prior negotiations, they being with his beloved Father in heaven concerning the people of planet Earth, his creation, and their need of a saviour to release them from the bondage of sin, and to give them hope and assurance of a vastly superior promised land than was Jordan to the Israelites. But there was an enormous cost attached to his father's plan if it was going to be successful. Calvary would be that enormous cost. But it was more than fully met for each one of us here today and for all others all others who love him and accept the merits of his precious spilt blood shed freely upon that cross some 2,000 odd years ago. However, there is a minor interlude before we return to a brand new recycled 
planet Earth, namely a short stay in God's heaven for a thousand years. Living in the mansions, Jesus said he would be preparing for us. One final thought. As good, as exciting, as wonderful, as fulfilling, as satisfying, and as complete in happiness, as we can arrange our existence here for the duration of our short lives, these present blessings of life, in other words, Yet God still sees them as a wilderness experience compared to what he has promised for our future everlasting happiness. I want to repeat that bit. As good, as exciting, as wonderful, as fulfilling, as satisfying, and as complete in happiness as we can arrange our existence here for the duration of our short lives, these present blessings of life, in other words, yet God still sees them as a wilderness experience compared to what he has promised for our future everlasting happiness. That's 1 Corinthians 2.9. I encourage you all to give it lots of serious thought, friends, because I truly believe we are much nearer the eternal city and the promised new earth than any of us possibly realise. Right on the borders, in fact. So for our closing thoughts, let's link up two final texts in this regard. They come to us from Matthew's Gospel 24, and both, I believe, are extremely relevant for God's people today. Watch, therefore, it says, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. And how does it describe his arrival, friends? Answer, for as the lightning cometh from the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And our response will be, this is our God, we have waited for him. We shout with joy, and acclamation. Amen? Amen. That's it, friends. We have a final hymn. It's uh, going to work on the same lines as uh, the message. Dear Heavenly Father, please dismiss us with your blessing and care for us all during this untried week ahead and may we be a mighty witness for you. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen.